Hey, what's going on guys? So by now you've no doubt seen all the benchmarks and analysis for the brand spanking new GTX 1060 and of course the recently released RX 480 from AMD. Well, I've seen them all too and I just want to give you guys my thoughts and opinions on both. I'm going to cover everything from straight up performance to efficiency temperatures, value, and finally, where I see these two cards fitting in for consumers needs today as well as in the future. One thing to keep in mind as we get going here is that all of these numbers we'll see in these tests, unless otherwise specified, have all been conducted using the reference 8GB RX 480 from AMD coming in at 240 bucks, and the 6GB Founders Edition GTX 1060 from Nvidia coming in at $300. Now, there's obviously going to be some wiggle room there for both GPUs in terms of pricing, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So just to go over the specs real quick, for those of you that have not been looking at your internet for the last two months, the GTX 1060 is based on the GP106, which is essentially just a 50% smaller version of the same Pascal-based GP104 found in the GTX 1070 and 1080, this thing is built on a 16 nanometer FinFET process by TSMC and comes packing 4.4 billion transistors, 1280 CUDA cores operating at a base frequency of 1506 with GPU boosting to 1709 MHz. It also includes 48 ROPs, 80 TMUs, and 6 GB of DDR5 running at 8 gigabits per second on a 192-bit bus, giving this card a grand total of 4.4 teraflops of computing power and 192 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Now, the RX 480, on the other hand, comes packing a completely different architecture and is built on a completely different manufacturing process as well. It comes bearing the full Polaris XT GPU from AMD featuring 2,304 GCN cores with a base frequency of 1120 MHz and a typical boost speed of 1266 MHz. This chip is built on a 14 nanometer Samsung FinFET process by Global Foundries, packing a whopping 5.7 million transistors using 8 gigabytes of DDR5 running at 8 gigabits per second on a 256 bit bus. This thing gets 256 gigabytes per second of total memory bandwidth and puts out about 5.5 teraflops of computing performance. Now, these are raw numbers, obviously, and don't really mean anything too significant other than giving us a good idea of what these will cost a manufacturer. So moving on to the first thing in our journey that is important, their performance. I'll be looking at performance on both of these cards in 1080p as well as 1440p, as I think they're appropriately powered for both resolutions. We're going to look at a number of different measurements here of performance from different sources, some of which you may have already seen, all of which will be linked in the description below. So I'll use one of my favorite guys first and get you guys some information from unboxed hardware. And we can see here that the GTX 1060 is winning in its fair share of games, certain margins being bigger and smaller than others, one of the major wins coming from Overwatch and the RX 480 winning in more of the next generation API scenarios such as Doom with Vulcan and Hitman seeing significant wins on the RX 480 at 1080p. We can see that in 1440p the gap does tend to narrow on margins of victory for both of these cards with the RX 480 seemingly having an advantage with the greater memory bandwidth to be able to push those pixels through to your screen but overall, it does appear that the GTX 1060 is the faster card by a small margin of around 5-6%. to Now, will this hold true in future benchmarks that make heavier use of things like asynchronous compute on next generation APIs is yet to be seen. But from the small sample that we have here currently, we can see some trends beginning to form. Okay, so now that we've seen the mix of benchmarks results, Let's take a look at how much power they use to actually get that performance and what type of impact that may have on their ability to overclock, their operating temperatures, and oddly enough, referring to the add-in boards, their price. So as far as power consumption is concerned, what is clear here is that once again, the NVIDIA chips are very, very efficient indeed. NVIDIA had a substantial lead in efficiency last generation with Maxwell, 
basically over all previous generations of GCN performance equivalents, with a few exceptions like the Power Hungry 980 Ti, which I have in my system right now, uh, and overclock that thing is just a destroyer of electricity. Uh, and an exception on the AMD side here and there with things like, like the 380 and Fury Nano, both of which deliver exceptional performance given their power draw. However, AMD have made massive gains in efficiency with their new Polaris architecture, leaving their previous power-hungry GPUs in the dust and nestling their first 14 nanometer GPU, the RX 480, right in between two of the previous front runners in terms of efficiency, the GTX 980 and 970. So that's a massive boost for AMD and a very good performance per watt relative to everything except basically Pascal. Obviously, NVIDIA have also seen gains in efficiency due to their own recent die shrink, going from 28 nanometers on Maxwell down to 16 nanometers with Pascal. They too have made improvements in their design that further aid these chips in providing more performance with less electricity. Now, the difference in power draw is obvious, but we really are going from good to great here, or from great to phenomenal even. One area that extra power usage is relevant, however, is in its creation of heat and the dissipation of said heat. Again, there is a $60 difference in price here, so NVIDIA can afford to use a more expensive and robust cooler on the Founders Edition of the GTX 1060, aka the Reference Edition, but they really don't need to. Since the card is only using around 100 watts of power during gaming, that small amount of electricity going through there really doesn't produce that much heat and can be cooled effectively with even a modest cooling solution. Now AMD by no means has to contend with a ton of heat or electricity either, but having made their reference design cost where the pricing starts, as opposed to somewhere closer to the top of what's available for those line of GPUs, as NVIDIA have done, the stock cooler for the RX 480 is simply less impressive. Not only that, but using closer to 120 to 125 watts under normal gaming loads, the cooler has to contend with roughly another 20 to 25 percent heat that has to go somewhere. So we end up seeing temperatures that are very, very low for the GTX 1060 Founders Edition at only 64 degrees after 20 minutes of game time at 1440p. That is ridiculously low. I have an aftermarket three slot cooler on my 980 Ti and my card at quote unquote stock from the factory overclock could run that cool, but again, it's a three slot cooler. So very, very good cooling performance on the GTX 1060. The RX 480 temperatures average out at about 81 degrees after 20 minutes of play on a reference card blower design is certainly not bad, uh, nor is it the loudest we've ever seen. And considering its price, it performs just fine. It's just that the GTX 1060 is once again very good with its use of power, and that turns out to be a great thing for temperatures, as you can see here. So all of these numbers are fine and dandy, but what do they really all mean? And what does it mean to you if you're looking at buying a consumer graphics card between $200 and about $350 in the near future? First, I'm going to look at the relative value of the reference cards, and then we'll look at where some of the partner cards could potentially fall in terms of their performance per dollar or overall value as well. Now, for the NVIDIA Founders Edition reference card, we're talking $300 for a card that isn't much faster than AMD's option for $240. We can see here that the GTX Founders Edition, on average, is getting one frame for every $5.17 that you'll spend to get that card at the retail cost. The reference RX 480, on the other hand, although it doesn't perform quite as well in the majority of DX11 testing in particular, it does only cost a relatively paltry $240, managing to get this card's cost per frame down to only $4.61, which is a pretty substantial gain. Now, in the next generation APIs, it's largely believed that AMD with its hardware-based async compute engines will have an advantage. And with DirectX 12 and Vulkan and the benchmarks that we have available to us now, the value is over twice of that already substantial gap that existed under DX11 with AMD's Polaris architecture seeing the advantage of those hardware-based asynchronous compute engines. 
they seem to gain an even larger percentage advantage under the new APIs than NVIDIA's Pascal that uses preemption and does see some gains. Although, like I say, the gains on AMD hardware tends to be substantially more substantial. Here, in these new APIs, the cost per frame is $5 for the GTX 1060 and only $3.93 for the 8GB RX 480. So a very, very good value there in terms of the amount of money that you'll be paying to get each of those frames on your screen. We can see that the add-in board partner cards for the GTX 1060 should be better in terms of their overall value, coming in at a lower dollar amount, but the two reference boards are both a pretty darn good value relative to everything else that's out there, including the 390 and the 390X from AMD, and the GTX 980 and 970 from Nvidia. Keeping in mind, I also mentioned earlier about how heat production could impact the cost of these add-in board partner cards, and I really mean it because the lower amount of electricity being used by the GTX 1060 and overall amount of heat being produced by that chip, um, Nvidia was able to supposedly get the pricing of their partner cards down to $250, while any card actually hitting that number will likely come with an absolutely tiny and inexpensive heatsink and fan setup, power phases, etc. The GPU should be able to get by just fine regardless, having a very low power draw. It just really shouldn't need robust cooling or a large number of power phases to kind of calm the power down, make sure it's consistent, etc. Or a backplate or a fancy PCB, uh, any of that stuff. So the add-in board partner cards that come uh, with these cheaper you know, more inexpensive solutions for cooling, etc., should be able to hit the regular clock speeds just fine, but you may find you run into some limitations there on the headroom that you have for overclocking. As you overclock, obviously your power draw and usage goes up, as does your heat, and those may not be substantial to kind of cover that gap, so to speak. So watch out for that. If you plan on overclocking your GTX 1060, um, I'd probably spend about $300 or up, but that is just me. Keep in mind that the GTX 1060 is only running off of one 6-pin power connector, but it uses just a small amount of power, 20-30 watts less even than what the RX 480 is using, but it should be able to overclock to its fullest potential just having the power from that 6-pin power supply as well as the PCIe slot. But the polar opposite really is true for AMD's RX 480. Here we have a reference car that has been produced and priced for maximum value. However, what this card doesn't have is a great cooling solution or a truly adequate amount of power to get the maximum performance from this very capable chip. And that's where the partner cards come in. With prices starting around $250, Add-in board partners can afford to spend a little more on their cooling solutions or a lot more if they'd like, and all of the cards I've seen from the partners so far do feature an 8-pin power plug from the PSU directly, giving these cards an additional 75 watts of headroom to pull power from the power supply and greater potential to reach higher clock speeds relative to the reference design. With all of this being said, I fully expect to see higher end, at least than reference partner cards of the RX 480 to be at the same price point as lower end than reference partner cards based on the GTX 1060. So what I mean there is that all the cards coming out from the add-in board partners that are going to cost more than the reference RX 480 should be superior in terms of cooling and performance. And I would assume that many of the cards coming out below the price of the Founders Edition GTX 1060, um, you know, will have more inexpensive coolers and may not perform as well under overclocking loads, etc. Regardless of the reference design, the blower style fans, etc., you know, I could see some different fan configurations working at lower price points, like I say, due to the lower power draw on that card. But when you start to overclock these cards, you may see less headroom on those cheaper models, so keep that in mind. Either way, we are set to have one epic battle here in terms of performance per dollar, not so much between the reference GTX 1060 Founders Edition, which in my opinion is just a bit too pricey for what it is uh, relative to what you're going to get in the add-in board partners, as is usually the case, 
but rather we're going to have a hell of a matchup here between the GTX 1060 partner cards for NVIDIA and basically all of the various models of the RX 480. You know, they've kind of spread that out nicely in terms of the value proposition there with four gigabyte models going for 199 and eight gigabyte variants with super high end cooling, probably north of $300, but they should perform relative to their cost. With manufacturers implementing things like better cooling, more power phases and better power phases, custom PCBs, etc., those cards should perform exceptionally well given the additional cooling and power available for that card to run. So the real question is, what do you buy now? Well, if you're in the market for a $250 to $350 card that has great performance at 1080p and 1440p under DirectX 11, that does pick up some additional performance with next generation APIs, you have to look at the GTX 1060. You will have to wait a little while longer to get one of these things at their intended retail price, which with Nvidia, sometimes we never get there, but we have our fingers crossed as always. Um, a quick check on Amazon right now, FYI, shows current pricing going for around 350 on the reseller slash poacher market. But hopefully NVIDIA and their partners can get ample cards out there to store shelves soon and we'll start seeing some more realistic pricing for these in the near future. If you're in the market for yet another VR capable graphics card starting at only $199, you can have the 4GB reference RX 480 today and as a bonus, that card might even unclock into a full blown 8GB card just by a VBIOS flash. That's not guaranteed, and it remains to be seen how well all of AMD's partner cards will fare in terms of their price and performance, and ultimately their value to consumers that want to just freaking game at maximum levels. But I really see this $250 to $320-ish market getting very, very competitive between partner cards featuring these two GPUs for some while to come. Of course, these two cards do each have their own distinctive features that make them unique and different advantages in different areas and a lot of similarities as well, but some really cool tech on both sides, some really great option for consumers any way that you look at it. And I cannot wait for all these partner boards to get here and see what the real tangible performance of both of these GPUs can be once they are fully unleashed by awesome cooling and plentiful power, great PCB designs, and just some really clean, efficient power coming their way. So I'm super excited for this stuff, guys. In the meantime, what do you guys think? Are these GTX 1060s going to be able to break 2100 megahertz? Can the RX 480 get up to 1600 megahertz with add-in board partner cards on air or water? And which card will ultimately wind up being the fastest card to use one of these two GPUs? If you have a pick for a card that you think will be the fastest champion, let's just say for DX12 Time Spy and call that the golden standard. If you guys see any information on that, post it below. If you have any guesses, let me know what they are. Which models from which manufacturers are you excited about? And which card do you think will wind up with not the best overall performance, but the best performance for the money out of all of them. Let me know below. I'm super excited to see what the RX 480 partner cards do with better cooling and more power. I've been hearing rumors for a while now that their clock speeds have allegedly seen massive increases. And although I'm sure Nvidia's partners have some pretty crazy stuff coming our way for the GTX 1060s as well, it's gonna be interesting to see for sure and great hyper competitive market for value to thrive in for consumers at the end of the day. So thanks you guys for joining me and listening to me rant as always. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you in the next one and peace out.